video games played from the first person have had a long and rich history, but before I delve into its past with the covert ops of Black, allow me to discuss its present with the newly released Graven, a maliciously medieval action adventure from 3D Realms and Fulcrum Publishing. In Graven, you control a broken priest of the Orthogonal Order who needs to purge the land of insidious sect who are responsible for both his exile and the sacrificial murder of his adopted daughter. To do this, you'll use a variety of melee weapons, projectiles, and magical spells to slaughter horrific zombies, slavering beasts, and crazed cultists in three distinct sprawling regions filled with traps, puzzles, and secrets. You can also take up a variety of multi-tiered side quests to earn you enough gold to upgrade your gear, because you'll need every edge as you explore the horrors of Graven's immersive dark fantasy setting, which you don't even need to do alone, as it also supports online co-op. You can even check me out exploring said horrors in the recent gameplay video I put out on my second channel. And if you like what you see, you can check out Graven by clicking the link in the description and pin comment below. It's out now on Steam, GOG, and EGS. Thanks again to Fulcrum Publishing and 3D Realms for sponsoring today's video. And without further ado, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to another hell-raising and guns a blazing episode of What Happened, the investigative YouTube-style pop culture media show that shines a light on some of the most shadowy and obscure developments in the entertainment industry. And really, it doesn't get more shadowy than the behind-the-scenes black ops of well, Black, the late-era 6th-gen first-person shooter that, despite having a significant amount of hype backing it up, didn't really take off as was originally intended. This, as most would attest, was the proverbial bummer, because the talented group of developers behind it, Criterion Games, were swinging into high at the time of its release. They had just been acquired by EA. Look, I'm not gonna dump on EA here, because, you know, I always do, so let's just move on. And, being smack dab in the middle of the very apex of the legendary Burnout series. However, due to a confluence of factors that came from within Criterion and uh, elsewhere, the UK-based studio's stab at shooting from the first person became a victim of both timing and circumstance, which cut off its potential from becoming a big money franchise. So grab your ammo belts, check your sights, and other weird gun stuff as I answer the question, what happened? to Black. Mr. Black. Founded in 1996 as a software arm of Canon, like the camera company Canon, Criterion eventually started cutting their teeth on racing and racing adjacent video games throughout the 90s and early 2000s. And while some releases, like Trick Style, turned some heads, it wasn't until the success of Burnout where they really started putting the pedal to the metal. This success was led by key employees, such as Fiona Sperry and Alex Ward, and while Burnout and its sequel Equal point of impact reviewed well, there are much bigger commercial successes over in Europe, as acclaimed UK were engaging in some uh, unique promotions for several of their upcoming titles, while acclaimed's main US firm were struggling to stay afloat. Thus, when Electronic Arts eventually came sniffing around in late 2003, they had been interested in purchasing Criterion ever since Trick Style, Canon were happy enough to sell the studio off. As it happily turns out, Burnout was Criterion's own independent IP, a claim had just been the publisher for it, so both it and the studio's fantastic 6th gen workhorse, Renderware, became property of EA. What had once started as a software tool in the 90s, Renderware then transitioned into a robust 3D engine that not only powered all of Criterion's efforts in the 2000s, but was also licensed out to dozens of other studios to make, you know, such middling efforts as Grand Theft Auto, various Harry Potter games, Tony Hawk 3, but who cares? It was used to make Killer7, Dark Watch, Ghost Rider, and WWE Crush Hour. Kurt Angle, 
prepares the twisty rockets. The engine gradually faded off due to the advent of Unreal, along with other competing publishers most likely not wanting to put even more money into EA's pockets once the technology rights transferred over to them. However, in the earlier days of Burnout 1, Criterion saw the engine's potential outside of just racing, and were thinking of ways on how to adapt it to work with the genre that was exploding on consoles at the time, the FPS. In issue 165 of Retro Gamer magazine, Luke Albige spoke to Criterion co-founder Alex Ward on the origins and very hectic development of Black, and why despite solid reviews and sales, it never saw a sequel. We figured that on PS2, we had good knowledge of the machine and that we could do a good shooter. The only one we had to beat was Medal of Honor, which didn't run that well on PS2 anyway, so we figured that if we could make a better game than that, we'd be all right. When we started doing the black prototype, the team was very small. We were just thinking about what could be done with the guns and if we could do it. Then we were bought by EA and it was good because we were already making this game and we told people about it. It would have been hard for them to then turn around and say, no, don't do it. As I mentioned earlier, the idea for black had been kicking around ever since Burnout 1. And when they finally did get the chance to put some people on it, they started by first producing what they called called a Ripomatic. This was basically a video mood board of different scenes from various war and action movies like Predator, Behind Enemy Lines, and Three Kings. However, this desire to be cinematic meant that unlike most of Criterion's output, which was all about vehicles crashing into each other, they would need to start producing various character models, implement facial animation, and figure out how to make cutscenes, which many on the team had little experience doing. While their technology and their ambitions to deliver an impactful, high-octane shooter were sound, it wasn't going to be easy. And having to craft some type of narrative and cutscenes for the first time in a video game meant that they could very well miss their target. In the Retro Gamer piece, Alex Ward revealed that in addition to Black having been greenlit, Criterion were also contracted to produce another Burnout sequel at the same time. And while they obviously could build off what had already been accomplished on Takedown, it still resulted in a staffing issue that needed to be resolved. The solution was to split Criterion's staff into two teams, with one shifting onto the dangerous highways of Burnout Revenge, while the other suited up to take on the shadowy wet work of Black. The latter team immediately started doing as much research as possible on how to create the most impressive and realistic firearms ever seen in a video game up to that point, while still taking measures to gamify them a bit, you know, as a little treat. Punchy sound effects, stunning muzzle flashes, and slick weapon models were the order of the day, but Criterion also had to consider how all that firepower would affect the game's environments. While not as extensive as Red Faction's Geomod technology, Criterion made sure that each level would at least play host to a meaningful amount of destruction, so that the effects of a prolonged firefight could be both felt and seen. And while the development team had confidence about what they were working on, there were still many issues that kept cropping up along the way, with most of them stemming from the fact that they were always short on time and manpower. Fortunately, the Black team did have a valuable asset with their lead programmer, Sean Murray. Yes, that Sean Murray, who before setting for the stars of No Man's Sky, helped bring all the bone-rattling explosions of Black to life, as well as all the spectacular wrecks of Burnout Takedown. Even with this talented team though, Criterion were still burning the candle at both ends. Burnout Revenge was set to blaze into stores in the fall of 2005, and EA wanted Black out by the first quarter of 2006, which meant it had to be deployed only three months after Revenge had wrapped up. According to Alex Ward in the Retro Gamer interview, it was a stressful time for pretty much all involved. Looking back, it was difficult. From Burnout 3, we went straight on to Revenge. I was working seven days a week, as was everybody. We went from that to finishing up on Black, which had to be finished by January 4th, which meant we were working through Christmas. We were in the office at midnight on Christmas Eve, playing through. At that point, I think we had about six levels built. 
things would get checked in and things would be broken. Me and Craig, Sullivan, lead designer, sat there crying on Christmas Eve. We'd sent everybody home, but we thought we'd stay and play five levels. I think we got to about level four and it crashed. How Criterion planned out each of Black's levels is a story in and of itself, in that they really didn't plan them out at all. They simply thought of environments that they felt would be exciting for a player to blast through, such as a crumbling city, a forest, and a graveyard, but didn't pay much mind into the why or how of it all. So they basically constructed the entire game, at least from a story perspective, backwards, building out various levels and scenarios, and then writing a story around them after the fact, which would be expedited even further by presenting the story in flashbacks. But even with that, Criterion knew that with the tight deadline and their lack of experience with cinematics and characters, their best choice for making these cutscenes work was to opt for the glorious days of live action, full motion video. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. <sighs> Space. Going the live action route meant of course for a much quicker turnaround time, and doing the whole flashback thing meant that they only needed a single environment as the narrative was designed to play out within the confines of an interrogation room. Even with this time-saving decision though, Criterion had zero experience in directing actors or filming live action material, and you know, even if they did, they had no time to do it themselves. Fortunately, it's here where a particular connection to Hollywood absolutely came in clutch. We were working with a guy called Nilo Rodas, who had a long career in movies, and he introduced me to a production designer called Joseph Hodges, who was working on 24. We didn't have much money, so we called him and asked him to film this stuff for us as a favor, and he said, I'll film it live action tomorrow at the 24 set before everybody gets to work. I said, what about costumes? And he spoke to someone in the costume department to help us out. The actors were told to turn up at like 5 a.m. at a stage in chat Worth LA, and we filmed it in the CTU interrogation room very early one morning, and nobody had to know. That was our secret, and he got it all done before anybody got to work. Joseph was brilliant and pulled it together, and it came out quite well. We were pretty happy with it. Funnily enough, Alex Ward also revealed to Retro Gamer that this somewhat secretive collaboration would get a little nod in a later episode of 24, where a character can actually be seen playing black on a TV. Although, sadly, the official 24 video game didn't use renderware to truly make this a full circle moment. While Criterion were really fortunate that their decision to pivot onto using live action worked out, there were still other areas of the game that proved problematic, or rather, it was problematic that they weren't there to begin with. With such a tight deadline and a reduced amount of staff available, Black's single-player campaign was never going to be the most girthy one on the market, at only eight levels, which, while acceptable today for an FPS, most FPSs today also contain some form of multiplayer, which was absolutely not something the team had scoped for at all. Unfortunately, this lack of content was going to be immediately noticed noticeable to both critics and fans, especially considering that Black was getting increasingly more hype as it was getting closer and closer to release. So with the cutscenes filmed and the team putting in all the extra hours during their holiday break, Black was able to make its January 4th deadline and released in late February on the Xbox and PS2 with a certain amount of aplomb. While it scored reasonably well with most critics, with the PS2 version now sitting pretty at a 79 average on Metacritic, those same reviewers were also quick to point out the game's very obvious flaws. Despite the effort and practicality on display, the narrative wasn't the most compelling, as it all boiled down to a lot of frantic 2000s-era style editing, dark, high-contrast cinematography, and incredibly basic characterization. Then, once you've beaten all eight levels, aside from one unlockable difficulty, there wasn't really much reason to play them all again, and the lack of any sort of multiplayer capability was absolutely called out, as it would have been since this was a post-Halo world.
world. It was also rather curious that the decision wasn't made to delay the game, which would have given the team more time to polish and add content and release it for the Xbox 360, which had been out for months, and the upcoming PlayStation Triple Ballin. They could have at least made it a cross-gen game, like all the fine titles you see here. I mean, look, even Burnout Revenge is here! Now, perhaps a reason for this lack of post-launch support was because, with Black now done and dusted, Criterion Games immediately launched into the development of Burnout Paradise, which was going to be the most ambitious title to date, and no doubt would be taking up a lot of their attention. In the Retro Gamer article, however, Alex Ward explained that since Black was a commercial success, selling at least 200,000 copies in just the UK alone, development of a sequel quickly began. There was so much more that the team had wanted to do, including many unused ideas they were forced to abandon to make the first game's strict release date. Things were starting to look promising even outside the first game's initial success, as 20th Century Fox, the distributor of 24, optioned to turn Black into a feature film and, in a supremely ironic twist, offered the project to Behind Enemy Lines director John Moore. Everything looked like it was going well. Uh, until it wasn't. Alex Ward explained that Criterion had somewhat of a Sophie's Choice style decision to make, with Black unfortunately getting the short end of the stick. All I know is that being in the middle of that whirlwind at the time was stressful. Coming out of that, I think we did about six months on Black 2, but in the end, we were starting Burnout Paradise. We were starting from scratch and didn't know how to author content on PS3. In the end, after making that decision to split one brilliant team into two good but weaker teams, we decided to bring the whole company back together on Burnout Paradise, so we stopped Black 2. What had been done had been sound. Again, white box stuff and some levels, and a pre-rendered sequence showing how we do better characters. It was going to take a lot of time and a lot of investment to do it. It was going to be one or the other. Looking back, I'm glad we didn't do it. I don't look back on it as personally or professionally a great time. I can see all the things I'd have liked to have improved through the software, but hey, we survived, and I'm not going to be too hard on the younger Alex and the team. Now, while Criterion has indeed technically survived beyond that, that decision, it has to be said they aren't nearly what they once were. Alex Ward and Fiona Sperry left the company in 2014 after EA showed no interest in greenlighting anything other than Need for Speed, which spurned them to form Three Fields Entertainment, producing the first two Danger Zone games, Dangerous Driving, as well as the upcoming Recreation. Other members of the Black team, including a uh, Stuart Black, left years earlier and joined up with Codemasters Guilford, where they released the, uh, less than ideal spiritual successor to Black, Body Count. In recent years, many have come to appreciate Black's bombastic firefights and straightforward design philosophy, so it's a real shame a sequel never really materialized, and an even greater shame that the studio who produced it has been exceptionally and thoroughly EA-ified, no longer having any semblance of the autonomy and uniqueness they once existed. Exhibited. Okay, so I lied about the laying off EA thing. D sue me! If you know of any other much maligned and mysterious ops in the video game or movie industries, do let me know in the comments below or breach the doors of my social medias. See you next time and thanks for watching!